Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave for another update video on the progress of building the cave so that we can open this place up to the public and today I'm focusing in on one room and one room only and that's this, the fake video game store from a, a late, well mid to late 80s to early 90s era. It's built based on my own recollections and memories and I imagine for you, judging by the demographic of the people who watch this channel, you'll have very similar memories, particularly here in the UK, but hopefully it will transgress across to other parts of the world. And uh, some of what you see here, like this slap board, will give you similar memories and experiences. Why is it so important for me to have this space here in the cave? Well, when you come to visit the cave, it's not just about using the machines. It's not just about learning about them and how we've preserved them here and the history of them. It's, a, it's about a whole immersive experience being here. I want you to uh, be stepping into a time warp. I want you to feel the nostalgia wash over you. I don't want you to just come here and use machines. I want you to be able to just sit in the corner like I am now, look around, take it all in, and just allow yourself to be taken back just for a few hours, half a day, however long you want to stay here and enjoy the experience. And I think this room serves that purpose more than any other part of the cave that I've built so far. I'm going to stop waffling now. We're going to cut to a walk around of the uh, completed room, nearly completed because there's a few extra touches and posters that still need to go up, but you'll get the idea and uh, leave a comment. I'll judge from your reactions whether you think I've hit the brief or not, or whether you think something else needs to be in here. So step with me back in time to my old school video game shop and let's have a look around. So that's our shop. I hope you enjoyed looking around it there. Um, I hope it gives you a, an overwhelming sense of joy as it does me just sat in here. Uh, I hope that um, if you come and visit, uh, visitors will really get that same sense when they come in here. And, and even if not, when we get back to things like the, um, the in-depth system videos that we haven't seen on the channel for a while because I've been so tied up with building the cave here, hopefully it'll make for a really nice backdrop. You know, each of these areas of the, uh, the cave they can act as a set 
Um, it's not only for visitors, it's not only for people coming here to enjoy it, we can use it for all of the future videos. So I'm really looking forward to finding new angles and new ways that we can use areas like this in those videos. Now let's talk about the building of the shop and Mark, Dean and Richard stepped up once again to help out. Well, the main construction work outstanding was the far wall, which is dedicated to the, uh, the console games there. And I went about sourcing and collecting new shelving and brackets for the shop because you'll remember in the last video we had some dodgy brackets and shelving turn up, so I have found a much better supplier. Although on the shelves the minimum depth of 30 centimeters that I can buy, well that just won't do. We had to chop them all down to be a lot more cassette tape friendly. The guys did a great job of building the wall. They did it in two sections, which allows us to easily remove the lower slat board if we need to, to service that radiator that's hiding there. It is turned off. We certainly don't want heated walls and games in here, so don't worry about that. And off to work they went on building it. They had the radiator to deal with. As I said, they had sloped ceilings to deal with. And just like I said in the last video, we're not shop fitters. We're figuring this out as we go along. And we are taking a, a belt and braces approach to everything that we do in the name of keeping the public safe. We don't want anything falling over. At the other end of the room, Richard finished up the box work around the bottom of the slat walls. He got the front and the top panels on there, lining up those slats beautifully. You can tell he's an engineer, can't you? And then I was able to follow that up by sanding down the filler between the boards. The floors in the cave are anything but even in some places, so getting this all to look flat was a lot harder than you might think. I then followed that up with a PVA glue and water mixture just to seal up the MDF so that the paint would take to it better. And then the only paint I could find at the DIY store that was close to the colour that I wanted was a weatherproof exterior paint, so um, it should be pretty hardy. It looks like you could paint a battleship with this stuff. While the paint was drying, the next job was to decide on stock. What were we going to put in the shop? Did I have enough stock? And amazingly, pretty much everything that you see in this room has been donated to the channel over the years. This all came from you. Now, sometimes the games are donated on their own, but more often than not, they come in boxes with a system. And those boxes have been in a shed, in a loft, somewhere like that. They certainly haven't been cleaned when they arrive. Not that I'm complaining whatsoever, I'm just grateful to receive them. So I did have to give them all a clean. If I was going to give this the look of a, a new shop with new games and give you that time warp experience, I had to clean them all. And um, well, this is the result oh, of cleaning cassette tapes. Absolutely disgusting. And someone who has kindly helped the cave for years to reach this stage is MonsterJoysticks.com, who you should visit for a range of arcade parts, adapters and joysticks for classic systems as well as modern rigs using USB, for that authentic arcade experience with genuine Sanware arcade parts. They even have a model you can mount your Raspberry Pi inside for emulation fans on the go. Treat yourself and your system to the joystick it deserves at MonsterJoysticks.com. And I can't really think of any here that didn't need a wipe down. They all had a, a level of dirt, some worse than others, on there. So once they were cleaned, the next question is how to present them. And I decided to shrink wrap every single game that's in here. Again, to give that experience of it being a brand new game. Is that authentic? Yes and no. Um, back in the day, there were shrink wrapped cassette games. Um, often you can tell that they're authentic because it's more of a folded shrink wrap, like, you, like you've wrapped a Christmas present or something. You have folds at the top rather than a seam, uh, which I've got here. Um, they also, it depends where you shopped. If you went to an independent computer shop, quite often you would find um, empty cases without any kind of wrapping. And the shopkeeper would keep all the cassette tapes in a drawer uh, out the back where it was safe, just to um, avert shoplifting and things like that. Uh, or sometimes you've got cassette games in these blister style packs, which I've got on the pegs here. Um, just because it was really convenient, especially for shops that weren't specialist computer shops. They could just put those on a peg and sell them like anything else. And that's exactly what we saw, carousels and carousels of games 
in all kinds of shops on the high street. So to shrink wrap all of them isn't entirely authentic, but it's not inauthentic either. And it serves a purpose, which is to allow people to come and pick them up and get their hands all over them, feel like they're new, but not make them dirty. So that's why I've shrink wrapped them all. The process of wrapping them is pretty straightforward. Using this machine, I encase the games in a video game body bag, sealing the edges closed with the arm. That big heavy arm has a heating element down its length. So you seal up the edges and then you wave a heat gun over it to shrink that packaging down into the shape of the box or whatever else you've put in there. In the case of this disc version of Beachhead for the Commodore 64, I've wrapped it and then I've applied a hanging tab so that I could put that up on a hook. And if it happens to get ripped off, then the original game isn't damaged. So I just wrap it again, put another tag on it, and it's fine, nothing is broken. And I quite like that style of presentation that we've achieved with it. Three days. That's how long it took me to wrap all of the 8-bit games. Three relentless days of cleaning and wrapping and putting on shelves. But I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining because I did really enjoy reading all the boxes and reacquainting myself with a lot of these old games and discovering new ones as well. And I did have a visitor in the form of Mark, another Mark, who popped in for a coffee and he helped me to get through the last batch of games. So thank you very much, Mark, for all your help with that. I should also mention that none of these shrink wrapped games will ever go anywhere near eBay or anywhere like that. This is an exhibition we're creating. These are exhibit items. They're being made fit for the purpose that I want them to serve and they're going nowhere else. So please don't worry about that. Many of the games I've wrapped with price labels still inside the wrap so you can see how much they were when they were sold or some of them had receipts tucked in them. So I've wrapped the receipt on the outside of the cassette box but still within the shrink wrap so that you can see a little bit of their history. And the more games that I put onto the shelves, the more and more this place took shape and really started to get the feel that I wanted from it. Now, by the time it came to putting big box games on the shelves, I had to admit I'd had my fill of shrink wrapping and I was already running behind schedule. So for now, I'm just putting them out on the shelves. They will all be wrapped as well before we open. I just need to mentally prepare myself for another shrink wrap marathon. And while I was putting out the games, I mentioned most of them here were donated. Well, more donations arrived in the form of a box from Simon Berryman. So thank you for sending these in, Simon. It included three flight simulators. You all know I'm a sucker for flight simulators. And also a bunch of Amiga Power magazines for the library. And I think I will add a small magazine rack into the shop area because magazines and games go hand in hand in a shop like this. So it will help with the authenticity of the feel and it will tie the two rooms together, the library and the shop area. Now a feature that was really important to me to get the look in here is the signage, these signs along here. I just had to get the look right. And to do that, I turned to some old WH Smith training videos from the 80s that have somehow made their way onto uh, YouTube. So I'll include a link in the video description. And by watching those training videos, I was able to freeze frame and get a good look at the store because for all my memories of going video game shopping in stores like this, they may well be rose tinted, you know, memories fade over time. So it was great to see those original training videos, just pause, take a look and say, okay, that's the kind of font we need. That's the kind of color we need and recreate them. So I turned to Illustrator and knocked up these signs. The font that WH Smith seemed to use was Gil or Jill Sands MT. And uh, with a bit of tweaking of the character spacing, I got it looking just how I wanted it to. I sent it off to, well, who else? Our friends at oneclickprint.com who did an outstanding job of producing these hard backed boards, which I think turned out brilliantly. So thank you, One Click Print. Other finishing touches included this delightfully hideous rug, which, uh, well, it really ties the room together, doesn't it? And then some plexiglass and tinting for the kiosk. That's the one thing that didn't go quite so well. I had some spare plexi, so instead of buying some new smoked plexi, I decided to use it for the kiosk and get some cheap adhesive tinting. <laughs> it didn't come out terribly, 
but there were still some bubbles by the end of it, which I can't get rid of. So I will probably just swap that out in the longer term for some actually smoked plexi rather than this horrible cheap stick on tint. The kind of stuff a boy racer might try and apply to his car to tint out the windows or something like that. We'll fix that, don't worry. And inside the kiosk, we put one of our Mr. Multi systems so I can reliably run pretty much any system that I want in here. At the moment, it's set up to run as a Super Nintendo with matching pads. We could swap that out for a, a Mega Drive and get some Mega Drive pads in there, whatever we want to put in there. And I think people are gonna really enjoy walking up to that and having a, a two player game of something there. It's a really nice space and a nice environment to be in to play games. So I'm really pleased with how that kiosk has come out. And that pretty much completed the build of the shop. Now I should point out before I get comments about it that our approach to this and indeed the whole of the cave is first and foremost, create our perfect space, create the perfect shop, create exactly what I wanna see, what I had in my mind when we started this process and be able to walk in and say, wow, this is what I really wanted. Phase two is then to make it public proof. So some of you have probably got concerns about people stealing cassette tapes or you might have seen a particularly valuable game or tape out on display. Don't worry about that. We are going to tackle that before we open things up. Um, just up there looking at me now are two CCTV cameras. There's one there, which we're still connecting up and figuring out the system and everything. So we are putting more and more security things in place to uh, ensure that people can enjoy the space. And uh, even if we do get a few rotten apples, it won't spoil the experience for everyone else. I'm sure, I'm sure we'll have nothing but lovely people come and visit. So let's end on a positive note. Just a couple of weeks ago, this room was my office. It was a mess and uh, it didn't resemble this shop whatsoever. We put in a huge amount of work and I'm really, really pleased with how it's come out. So uh, thank you, Mark, Dean, Richard, other Mark, everyone who's got involved in helping to make this possible. And um, I can't wait for people to come and enjoy it. I'm not going to be looking at the shop. I'm going to be looking at people's reactions as they come in the door just to see what it does to them and if it hits the spot or if we can tweak it even more to uh, enhance that experience of stepping back in time. As always, thank you for watching. There will be, I think, one, maybe two more episodes on building the cave. Um, next, we've got to build the kitchenette so we can provide teas, coffees and snacks, sort out the reception area. The glass cabinets have now arrived for the museum -y space area. Uh, they're downstairs. I haven't figured out how to get them up here yet because they're pretty big and uh, I'm going to need three or four people to help me get them up there. So that's all going to happen in the next episode. But I think you can understand why I wanted to really focus on this room today. And I hope you've enjoyed it. As always, thank you for watching. Take care. Thank you so much for your support in helping to make this happen. And I'll see you next time. Bye bye.